Hello, and well, I'm going to quickly start, before I jump into the Blonde class, although that's going to be topic today, by saying thank you for this lovely shirt, the Bergeron. Uh, saying thank you to, again, for your support in actually getting me to this go see Haida. I can never put in words just how much that whole trip to Canada meant. Seeing Sackville was amazing. Going on Sullivan's was absolutely spectacular to go and look at this port of this ship, see how well she'd recovered from her recent issues, but also see her as an example of the American destroyers that fulfilled a very similar role in their own way as the tribals and get to have a look around her. But going aboard Haida, the last tribal in the world. I'm not sure if it'll be the same if I get to see HMA's Vampire. When I get to see HMA's Vampire. Yeah. But I can't imagine it'll be that much different. Because I've lived with those ships in my head for so long, not seeing them. And actually seeing them was a big thing. But speaking of that trip coming up, now, we've got some ideas of fundraising, and you may like this idea, you may not. We've sort of had the idea, or Robert Drak has had the idea, of with Dr. Dan standing by, um, us having questions for him put on my Patreon, questions for me put on his Patreon, so neither of us can see them. And if we get those questions wrong, we have to eat a very, very hot pot wing. And basically, it gets hotter the further on the questions go. Or Basically, it's a, it's a point system, and whoever actually ends up breaking first loses, I think. Uh, hence Dr. Dan watching. There are a few other ideas like this wandering around, or things which you can do which could hopefully raise funds for the trip. Um, you might hear a jingling just there. That was the big fluff, the fluffy research assistant himself, coming in from the garden where there is a hose on. So he decided to walk straight through the hose and then come into my office with all my books. Thank you, fluff. Thank you. Anyway, that's what we've got going on. We are, of course, though, four minds. We know how big an impact these naval history trips seem to have. We know they're very they're very good for people. The our only problem is justifying their expense. We can't legitimately do it based on incomes, and so that means we either have to sort of we have to work out a way to fund it. And if we can get grants, if you know of grants, that'd be a great thing. We'd go for them. Uh, we remember I got a partial grant for the trip to Canada. And frankly, between you and the trip, for, uh, you and the grant, that paid for a large, very large chunk of Canada. Thank you very much for that. But we need ideas. So, sort of for fundraising. No, don't worry, we're not selling you. Um, but, you know, whatever the uh, ideas. And the thing is, all the brains that are watching this are far more better than just us four. So, if you can think of them, That'd be really good. Um, Australia, it's possibly Australia, Japan, and Singapore. Possibly just Australia and Singapore. Um, it, the, the working it out is how much can we fit in, whilst also in a certain time. Because there is a sort of hard limit on, to be fair, on how long Drakenfell and myself, all of us, can be away from home. So we have to work out what we can fit into roughly a two to three, maybe just edging into the fourth, but not the full fourth week. Because of the needs of not only the channels, but also our home lives. Um, and the thing is, the more ideas and stuff, ideas and stuff we come up with for, let's say, one part of the trip, that means the less time there'd be necessary for the other part. So we might end up breaking it up into multiple trips and multiple years. But we'll see. Anyway, let's get on to the more interesting topic that is the Blonde class than fundraising. Because, let's be honest, fundraising is far less interesting than uh, far, uh, far less interesting than Blonde class. 
The Blonde class are the second to last edition. They are the second to last of the class of... Well, the Royal Navy Technicals and Scout Cruisers, but let's be honest, they're destroyer killers. That's what they are. We've, you know, they're flotilla, they use the flotilla leaders, they use all sorts of things, but what they are is destroyer clo killers. It's basically you've built the torpedo boats, which can't bring the torpedoes. Then you built torpedo boat destroyers. Oh, cool. And then you need something to kill the torpedo boat destroyers. You need a TBDD. Now, the trouble is, you go through several variations as destroyers themselves, because that's what the torpedo boat destroyers end up becoming called. So let's be honest, TBD or torpedo boat destroy or destroyers. Can't say anything, of course. There was a certain book which might have, if you think about it, Tribal's Battle Starings, Torpedo Boat Destroyer. <laughs> so the Blonde class are for killing destroyers. Hence, they're armed with rather a large number of four inch guns and three pounders. They also have two single 21 inch torpedo tubes. Which is nice. But honestly, these ships are built at Pembroke Dock. Which becomes the Royal Navy's... After the Royal Navy did that wonderful thing of getting multiple civilian yards to build their own versions of what they think the best scout crews would be. The Royal Navy then goes, you know what? We think we'll build our own version." In one of our own dockyards. Yes, that's just just to synthesize our ideas, you know. Basically, nick the best bits from all of you lot and um, turn them into something else. Good old Pembroke Dockyard. But they are built between 1909 and 1911, so they are built from four years after the Dreadnought really sort of starts to cause a scene. Well into the Dreadnought construction era. And they'll be in commission 1910 to 1921. The fact is, both will serve through World War One, and won't be lost. And both will technically serve with battleship squadrons for quite a large chunk of that time. What they do with the battleship squadrons is always an interesting thing. But mainly, it's uh, actors, both sort of scout, repeater... Basically, if we were being honest, they start fulfilling the function that frigates did in Age of Sail Battles. I know, shock. But when you're thinking about it, you'll face the same problem when you've got a large fleet together firing online. All that smoke, communications down the line, becomes obscured by the smoke from all the ships. And the further you get back, the more problems you get. So having a cruiser sitting out here, small cruiser sitting out here, and getting the signals, observing them, and then reporting them back makes sense. Now, you can go, oh, well, what about radio? Well, that's as long as your antennae work. <laughs> and as we all know, wires can be shot away surprisingly easy and very quickly. Most often by your own guns. So, yeah, that's not such a reliable thing. So you're still using flags and visual communications, and here is your nice visual repeater unit. So here are their stats. Displacement. 3,350 long tons. That's 3,400 normal tons. 123.7 meters in overall length. That's 406 feet. A beam of 12.6 meters. That's 41 feet, 6 inches. A draft of 4.7 meters, or 15 foot, 6 inches. They carried 12 Yarrow boilers. Thus, these ships were able to deploy 18,000 shaft horsepower via two Parson steam turbine sets across four shafts for a top speed of 24 and a half knots, or a range of 4,100 nautical miles. Now, why is that important? Well, if we consider compared to the boat, a previous Bodicea class, they could go, Bodicea could do 25 knots, or Boudica, depending on who you are. 
Uh, if we go back to the old Sentinel class, 25 knots. The Pathfinder class, 25 knots. The Forward class, 25 knots. So, what are these actually taking? They're actually taking a cut in speed of half a knot. You're fixing, uh, you're fitting turbines for these ships, and you're not taking advantage of it to give yourself higher speed. I, I just, I, I have no words for it. I honestly, I don't. But it's fine if you start to consider themselves able to kill destroyers, and their job isn't really scouting. You see, if they were supposed to be for scouting, they'd need the high speed. So if you actually believe the designation of Scout Cruiser, their speed of 24 and a half knots makes no sense. If you consider them the role, no, hang on, no, these are large frigates from age of, in age of sail terms. These are, are destroyer killers. They are going to act as signal repeaters for the battle squadrons, maybe act as occasionally backup for the destroyer flotillas and killing other destroyers suddenly those that that knotage starts to make sense roughly i'd still want more but i can just about make sense of it they carried 780 long tons at 790 normal tons of coal and 190 Long tons of fuel oil. This is what gave them the range of 4,100 nautical miles at 10 knots. <sighs> there is often a debate I get into with various other historians. And it, the debate is the construction emphasis of the fleet prior to World War One, And I often say there's a transition. From about 1885 to about 1906-ish, 5-ish, 6-ish. Broadly speaking, the emphasis on the Royal Navy is producing a fleet which will fight anywhere in the world. From about 1907-8-ish, it turns into a navy to fight in the North Sea, because Germany is becoming the primary threat. It's a problem the Royal Navy will go through again, and it's one of the things it's transitioning out of at the end of World War One, because at the end of the World War, it, by 1916, after the Battle of Jutland, after everything else, yes, Germany's still a threat, but the Royal Navy is starting to think in terms of its cattle units of what it's going to need in a post-German world. Because here is the obvious thing. This war isn't going to end without there being only one of us left. And Britain wouldn't countenance the idea it wouldn't be it. And let's be honest, in 1916 onwards, that's really not the likely scenario. Yes, there are issues. Yes, there are all sorts of problems with the submarine war. But it's still looking fair like the British High Command that it's going to be tough, but we're going to win this one. So what's your future war? Well, hang on. A future war could be against who? Is it going to be against the French? <laughs> no. They've been massacred by this war as well. Is it going to be against the Italians? Unlikely. They've only just recently unified, and frankly, in national terms, they look quite small. Is it going to be against the Americans? We'd hope not. They're about the same size of us in terms of their industrial might, and they could be an interesting problem to deal with. But there again, they do have that hamstrung of Congress seems to be very much small recent nation state mindset of why do we need to look beyond our own borders? Constantly coming up. 
And there's this great guy over there. If we start building some b big dreadnoughts, you can guarantee the ships they're going to build are going to be terrible. I mean, he wants massive ships with 16 guns on them. I could imagine the entire conversation. So, who are the possible potential threats? Well, Japan's technically an ally. Russia is technically an ally at this point, but has a long history of being problematic. The whole thing Britain's sure, it can be sure about, is Britain can't really pick out its next enemy, but it can be sure it's probably not going to have to fight the battle in the North Sea again. In that, whatever its fleets are going to have to do, they're going to have to be mobile worldwide. Especially if they want to use them for deterrent in peacetime. And this brings around, and this is the winning case which makes the Admiral class happen, which makes the wider fleet development happen, and it's why the G3s are being ordered before their battleship equivalents. Because battle cruisers, emphasis on the separation between the battle and the cruiser, are the critical asset for global reach and global presence. But then if we go back to the Blonde class, they're of course built in this period when they are looking at fighting in the North Sea, when that's going to be the crux de gear. It's going to be the critical area for the Royal Navy of any war. And they select this four-inch gun. This glorious four-inch gun. And they have ten of them. They have ten of these four-inch guns, these Mark Seven guns, which I've discussed before. They're fitted to the Belfon class, the Vincent class, the Bodicea class, Bodica class, Neptune, Atrus Neptune, the Colossus class, Indefatigable class, Orion class, Lion class, Bristol class, of course the Blonde class, but Active class, and the King George V class battleships. They are fitted all over the place in World War One, and that's because it's a really good, really reliable gun. It fires a 31 pound shell, and if I expand it, you can see the mechanism. Pretty darn good. Their total mass, including barrels and breech, is 2.1 stone. <clears throat> no, 2.1 tons, sorry. Misreading my own maths here. I had it worked out in stone as well, and there's a difference. As you can imagine, the total barrel length uh, is roughly 5 meters long, 5.1. One meters to be precise. So there are fifty point three caliber technically, not a fifty caliber. The elevation negative ten degrees to plus fifteen degrees from a standard mount. And their rate of fire was between six to eight rounds a minute, largely achieved thanks to the uh, shell weighing in at just fourteen kilograms. So being quite easy to move. Muzzle velocity, 2,852 feet per second. That's 869 meters a second. Maximum firing range, 11,600 yards. Oh, 10,600 uh, meters. And that was at uh, 15 degrees. So they are good systems. They really are. And if we consider the 21-inch torpedo going around at the time, which the Royal Navy was using, uh, we'll go for the sort of the Mark II. That operational range of that torpedo was 8,000 yards maximum. The Mark IV. Well, that had a maximum range of 13,500 yards. So, a gun which is quick firing and has a range of roughly 11,600 yards is pretty darn useful for something which is going to kill destroyers. Especially a reliable gun. And... That's the purpose of these ships. Again, think where they're going to be in battle. They're going to be the offside. Repeating the signals. 
It's also going to decide which these ships are not going to be watching as much. And if you're a really sneaky commanding officer, a really sneaky opposition admiral, you might well try and curl round with your destroyers. You might want to try and get them to come and attack from the offside. That'd be a sensible thing to try and do. After all, if they're attacking from the engage side, then there's going to be 15 inch, or we're up 12 inch, 13 and a half inch, 11 inch, and 15 inch shells going backwards and forwards. And whilst they, you know, that's quite a large chunk of metal moving backwards and forwards, they might not actually go off when they hit. In fact, they probably won't go off when they hit a destroyer, but just the sheer force of it thundering through your World One era destroyer is not going to be good. It's going to be. It's going to definitely qualify as a significant emotional event for the crew, let's be honest. It probably won't go off in the ship, because the shell probably won't realise it's passed through something that light of metal. But it would not qualify as a good day. So if you can swing them around... Mm -hmm. Now, again, that doesn't mean the enemy won't attack the engaged side. There are plenty of attacks which do involve attacking the engaged side. But having something securing the unengaged side, just in case, is rather helpful. Now, the three pounder Vickers. I do love this little gun as well, because this is the sort of gun which you sort of go, Ooh, and what happened to you? Why weren't you developed more? It's a semi-automatic vertical block breach system, which is rather cool when you think about it, but it does allow for a significant rate of fire, 20 rounds per minute. Uh, they standard were put in to a three-legged platform. They were designed between 1902 and 1903, and there are between 600 built across the Mark I and Mark II variants. They're in service till 1940, definitely, but we're fairly certain that some actually served longer than that, because they were reliable and they worked. Their muzzle velocity was 2,575 feet per second, or 785 meters a second, with the high explosive. In the AA mode, they could have effective firing range of 2,000 yards, or 1,829 meters. Uh, but on the anti-surface, well, at a 12 degree elevation, they could achieve 5,600 yards. Uh, that's 5,100 meters. It is noted that their theoretical ceiling in AA mode was uh, 4,600 meters or 15,000 feet, but um, there is a difference between what is effective firing range and maximum firing range, and the effective was the 2,000 yards. So, hmm, yeah. It's always fun. Again, pretty useful weapon for engaging destroyers and quite easy to modify to the AA roll. So let's consider HMS Blonde and her career. She does have an interesting one after all. Not quite as interesting as her sister. Her sister definitely wins the grade for having the most interesting career between these sisters. She is the eighth and the last ship of the name Blonde. Um, laid down, as said, at Pembroke Royal Dockyard on the 6th of December 1909. Launched the 22nd of July 1910 by Lady Frances w uh, Williams, uh, wife of, well, Sir Arthur Oswald Wynne Williams, uh, a mostly, mostly liberal, uh, liberal party politician of the Welsh. She was completed in May 1911, and Captain Thomas Bonham was put in command. She then served as leader of the 7th Destroyer Flotilla in Mediterranean throughout 1912. But when Captain Arthur Hulbert assumes command, she joins the 1st Destroyer Flotilla of the 1st Fleet on the 10th of May 1912. The 1st Fleet was a formation that sort of briefly exists in World War I. In World War I um, well, just before World War One, 
between 1912 and 1914. It's sort of a forerunner of the Grand Fleet in some regards. <clears throat> he was lost at sea in 1913 and replaced by, yeah, rather bad form, losing your captaincy, replaced by Captain Thomas Shelford, who in turn was relieved by Captain William Blunt on the 25th of April and transferred to the scout cruiser Fearless. In 18th of June, 1912, he, the ship was uh, transferred to the 4th Battle Squadron to take up her role of supporting that Augustus unit, and Captain Albert Scott assumed command on the 5th of July. She was with 4th Battle Squadron at the start of the war in August 1914, and Captain John Casement would achieve command in 1916, May 1916. Well, was in command between March and May 1916. Uh, prior to that, Blonde and Flotilla Leader Broke, which of course was a Faulkner-class destroyer leader, were on patrol east of Scarva Flow when Blonde accidentally had a depth charge explode and damaged her upper deck and killed two of her crew. This resulted in the Egerton depth charge, which was that which was carried by Blonde, being withdrawn from use by the Grand Fleet. She was under refit in April 1916 and missed the Battle of Jutland. But October that same year, she rejoined the 4th Battle Squadron with Captain Basil Brook in command was transferred to the 1st Battle Squadron in April 1917, and Captain the Honourable Arthur Forbes Simple assumed command in February. I think February 1918. In June, Commander Theodore Hallett relieved Forbes Simple. And in September 1917, mm, well, from September 1917, she was converted into a mine layer. Although I would never lay mines in combat. Commander Hallett was in turn relieved by uh, when the ship came out of refit by Captain Gregory Wood Martin. He would retain command until 1990 when he turned over command to Morris Evans. That's Captain Morris Evans. Then Blonde was placed in reserve, assigned to the Nor Reserve by May, along with sister. They were scrapped in 1920. And broken uh, and Blonde herself was broken up in Netherlands. She had a good career. She had a lot of time on service. And one of the things I would say, and I would be very thankful for in this particular thing, uh, this particular product, is that in this particular video product. Sorry. I'm going to leave that in because it's good to leave in the fact that I get tongue twisted sometimes. Uh, we're all human. But yeah, it's also because the rest of this recording has been quite good. So I'm going to like that. And editing and round of causes issues. But there are some really good naval staff monographs, which I have been able to hunt down thanks to their being linked to, honestly, in Wikipedia. So I did that whole trick of going to the um, bottom of the Wikipedia and finding the monographs. And they are all in PDF form and have been beautifully, beautifully uploaded. 191 pages in one and 47 in the, in the other. And they're the last off raid. And well, the Naval Staff monograph is just gorgeous. It's the home waters, 1915 to 1916, October 1915 to May 1916. And it's, they're really worth a read. And it was something I really have to admit was a very cool find for me. And it's made a lot as possible. Right, Blanche. Now, Blanche, as has been said, has a slightly more active career. A slightly more active career. Although, 
Again, remember what I've discussed about their role in combat. So she was the seventh ship to carry that name. And she was launched by Mrs. Monday, the wife of Captain Godfrey Monday, who was superintendent of Captain Superintendent of the Pembroke Royal Dockyard on the 12th of April 1909. Well, she was laid down. She was launched by Lady Mai Phillips, wife of Sir Owen Phillips, Member of Parliament for Pembroke and Harvard. So there was a real effort going on with Welsh politicians for this. The Royal Navy wanted them on side. It made coal supplies easier for starters, but also it's always helpful to get local politicians to understand exactly who's paying for all these people to be employed. In October 1911, the ship struck on a rock at Penland Skerries and suffered damage to her bow and stern, and this was while she was serving as a flotilla leader of the first destroyer flotilla. Uh, Captain Milford Henderson assumed command of the ship, and she joined 4th destroyer flotilla of the first fleet in May 1912. She then transferred to the 3rd battle squadron as of 18th of June 1913. And she is a good-looking ship. At this point, Captain Richard Hyde assumed command. Blanche spent much of the early 1914 patrolling off the Irish coast during the Home Rule crisis. She was still there assigned, technically, to 3rd Battle Squadron. And when she was damaged in Pentland Firth, due to severe weather, she was damaged while intercepting on their orders. German ship, well, being sortie to intercept on their orders, German ships bombarding ports in Yorkshire. She's then transferred to 4th Battle Squ uh, Squadron and joins her sister Bondi in January 1916. 20th of February, she was one of the three cruisers dispatched to patrol the Norwegian coast during the hunt for the uh, German surface raider, the SMS Gris. Although she herself did not manage to come into contact with that ship before she was sunk. Uh, Captain John Casement relieved High in, in May that year, and during the Battle of Jutland, she took position to the rear of the squadron during the battle, so did not fire her guns. So, they positioned the cruisers around, and this is the line of cruisers, uh, this is the line of battleships. Right. Her position was off here. There was another cruiser, I forget which one, which would have been here. So they've got two cruisers, they've got the line. You've got eight battleships in a battle squadron. The two cruisers roughly, roughly operate opposite number two and opposite number seven. That's the ones they're in parallel in that line. Okay, with the third and the fourth division laid out. I think that's what the fourth squadron had, well, were, third and fourth division. There's an easy way to answer this question. I could just click on, uh, on my notes and go through it. Yes, there you go. Word file up. It's got eight. Yes, it's got third and fourth division. Third division, Iron Duke. Of course, John Angelico in charge. Uh, Ro uh, Royal Oak under Captain C. McLaren. So that would be what the Florent cruise would be opposite. Superb under command of Rear Admiral L. A. L. Duff, who would be second in command of the squadron. HMS Canada under Captain w, uh, WCM Nicholson. Fourth Division, Bembo, flagship of Vice Admiral Sir D uh, Dubton Sturdy, who's in charge of the squadron. Uh, Bellafron, Captain E.F. Buren, Temeraire, Eve Underhill, and Vanguard, J.D. Dick. So Temeraire is what Blanche would have been marking her station on. And that's how they're coordinating. Okay, so that's how the signals, the signals are being repeated. So flags go up, boom, boom, boom. The cruiser line that's backing up the battle line, <laughs> their flags go up, da 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 da, -da. and all the crew battleship, all the battleships' flags go up. Yay! We're acknowledging. We've all got signals. Woohoo! It all works. Hmm. What's the interesting thing about Fourth Battle Squadron is that um. In 1918, HMS Dreadnought rejoins the squadron as flagship in March 1918. 
of fourth battle squadron. Oh, fourth battle squadron. It's one of my favorite units. <sighs> and I find it, you know, sad it didn't actually get reconstituted in time for World War Two. A shame. But Blanche is a cool ship, and that's what she's getting up to. After Jutland, well, she was detached from the ground fleet to be converted into a mine layer. Um, Casement was relieved by Captain the Honourable Reginald Plunkett Ernel L. Drax, who probably deserves an entire video about him at some point. Uh, Sir, technically, Sir Reginald Almir Ranfurly Plunkett Ernel Earl Drax. Give him all his full names and surnames. Almost as impressive as me. Admiral the Honourable. And um, yeah, he has an interesting experience. He'll well, he goes up to director of the Royal Navy College. Unfortunately, um yeah. Years of service, serves till 1941, does a mission to Moscow. Mm. He served as a convoy commodore <clears throat> during the Battle Atlantic. He retires in 1941, joins the Home Guard, transfers and becomes a convoy commodore in 1943 to 45. Interesting, interesting admiral. But again, we'll talk about it at some point. But yeah, the the cruisers have an important role in the Battle of Jutland. I've all sort of already sort of covered that. But um, yeah, but yeah, it's going to become this video's theme, isn't it? Blanche did actually let manage to lay some mines in the entrance of the Katagat on the nights of eighteenth, nineteenth, and twenty fourth and twenty fifth February nineteen eighteen, and. This was part of a total of 1,238 mines laid during 16 sorties during the war. Eventually, Captain Francis Buller takes command of her in April 1918, and he's relieved by Captain Charles Wrightson in January 1919. The ship was assigned to the 5th Battle Squadron in February 1919, but was then sent to Nor Reserve. She was listed for sale, along with her sister, as mentioned, on the 18th of March 1920, but uh, she'd be broken up in Sunland, not the Netherlands. Now, why have I got this Jutland map up in sort of this very simplistic gra graphic of Jutland? Because one of the interesting things I often find about the maps is this. If you look at them, they're very much showing where the battle line is. They very much talk about the capital ships, about the battleships and the battle cruisers, which are lovely. But it gives you a kind of false impression of the battle. You think of this battle as this line. You don't see the swarms of destroyers gathered around their flotilla leaders like a horde of angry ducklings following their mama. You don't see the line of cr battleships, but also this this line with a repeat, this sort of shadow line of repeating the cruisers, providing signals, supporting them. You don't see the cruiser divisions themselves, these mighty groups of four and eight, going around looking big and impressive, sweeping along, the line ahead, line astern constantly maneuvering to provide themselves with the best position to fire their counterparts and this constant parrying and reposting going on. We talk about the big movements of the Battle of Jutland. We talk about the big fleets, you know, the deployment of the battle line, the bangs and bombs going on of that. You don't hear as much about what the small ships are getting up to. And the reason you don't is because, in a nice way, no one really focuses on them, but also it's so much more intricate, complicated, and ultimately it requires an entire another dimension. If I was drawing maps which had all their movements on, 
I would be drawing maps for the rest of my life from the Battle of, I don't know, well, the Battle of Jutland would be not much of my life, it'd be a couple of lives, but from Dogger Bank alone. What the small ships are getting up to, the shadow battles they're fighting. The, in many ways, the high notes and low notes, the uh, the interlocking melodies of the symphony that they are accomplishing or failing to accomplish are an entire another thing going on. And that's the reality of the Battle of Jutland. So whenever you look at these maps, I want you to think about in your head that represents a unit. The unit is going to be many dots on that map. They're all going to be moving. Sometimes in a very complicated pattern, sometimes in a very simple pattern. But there are going to be multiple units and they're going to be interlocking together. And that's the reality of these battles. A force is more than the sum of all its parts. It's how it's used and it's how those parts are used. That will make it, that will add up to its final amount. And these ships, the launch goes through the largest battle you will ever hear about in terms of ships firing guns at each other. There you go, there's my notes. And yet, she doesn't fire her guns. Now, the interesting thing about Sturdy, and he's another person who probably requires his own, at some point, video, because I both find him annoying in terms of some of the things he does, but also find him quite interesting. And the fact is, he is the grandfather of William Staveley, and the grandfather-in-law of Edward Ashmore, who, of course, if you remember your previous videos from me, in the Sing Townsend, Edward Ashmore is the midshipman who is standing on the SS Vincent de Paul, St. Vincent de Paul going, no, you can't come aboard. So, there's the thing. This is the guy who's in charge of the squadron that Admiral Jellicoe's got his flagship in is the grandfather-in-law of the guy who, in 1939, is responsible, in many ways, for us not having a war with Japan starting in January 1939, because of the way he acts. It's not a long way away. It's not many steps removed. <sighs> Also, I would like it pointed out, you know, Royal Oak sitting there, fifteen-inch battleship sitting in his battle in his squadron, sitting the one behind Jellico. So these ships. The problem with them is that in many ways they are a product of the same idea which produces the Condottieri. And that the idea is how do we kill destroyers? We'll build something which is basically is an enlarged destroyer without thinking through what that reality means. The difference is that these ships do have some degree of armor. They have one eight, oh, 0.5 to 1 inch of deck armor. That's always good. And a four inch conning tower. Well, hey. But there's also reality that these ships, when they're built, are not being built for that role. They're still being built using the cover of that name. 
because that's now an accepted name, so no one's taking any notice of the Royal Navy building ships like that. But when you're talking about building up a Grand Fleet, which is going to have half a dozen squadrons in the end of battleships, if you go for it, you need roughly three to four, depending on av availability of those glasses, small cruisers for each squadron to act as repeaters, because you need two available for any battle scenario. The scout cruisers can fulfill that role. They can fulfill that role very well. Lanch does it excellently. She goes through the entirety of Jutland. She's not damaged much. She's not needed to fire her guns. Does she still do an important role? Yes. Is she still critical to the victory? Yes. <clears throat> and why do I call Jutland a victory? Because for the Royal Navy, as long as the German fleet goes back home and doesn't get into the Atlantic and doesn't do anything bad like that, it's a win. It's about control of the sea, not about who scores points. And this is 4th Battle Squadron, it's line out. They look good, don't they? So we've got it coming. Well, we've done the Suffering class. This was the Blonde class. So I really should have those underlined. And next week we have the Northampton class. That's going to be fun. We've got internal lives. Modern Frigates cruises by another name. And, of course, the recorded video for that will be out on Saturday. I've got to work out exactly which one of my planned UAD, Ultimate Animal Dreadnought videos, I'm going to be doing for Friday. I've got a couple options. But again, I will emphasize, please, ideas. If you have them for how we can fundraise for our next trip, how we can all get, get money together, who, you know, what kind of organ, uh, what kind of grants we can get, and what kind of support we can get, and also ideas for ships for us to visit. You know, as I said, we're looking at the Pacific ships, uh, infrastructure, personal choice for me and John Bull, who comes with us, of course, uh, is railways, <laughs> railroads, call them what we will. We like visiting them. We have already said that if we do Australia, we are doing the GAN. Done before anyone debate, uh, thinks there is a debate on this. No, we have won the argument. Uh, uh, Mrs. Drack has said <laughs> that we get to do the GAN. <laughs> there is no veto solution anymore. We have won the argument, not that one. Um, but no, so that'd be cool. But we would love to hear ideas from you. We have, of course, Jamie busily suggesting tons of ideas. But yeah, what ships are there to visit in Singapore? What ship, what forts are there to visit? What infrastructure is there to visit? Who else do we visit? Um, I have a lot of friends in the Singaporean Navy. I'd love to do a chat with them if they would be interested if we're out there while we're out there. And of course the Australian Navy. We'd love to meet up here. And again, if there is going to be a big conference in Australia and you know about it and it hasn't yet been advertised yet, about next year sometime, and you think we would be good it would be good if we could come along to it, we'd love to know when it isn't going to be so we can try and schedule the trip around coming to it, because we'd love to be there. So thank you very much. Take care, and I uh, hope you enjoyed. And right then. So I always finish Dita with another question. So I've got the question going out there of suggestions for how we fund and support and what we should do on the, the next trip, next Naval History trip. The question for this episode I'm going to end on is this. Please feel free to comment away widely. And maybe even design, do put some designs together on you, on various things you want. But what do you think, considering these cruisers and what they actually did, mine laying, communications, what a 
title do you think they should be given other than Scout Cruiser? Because let's be honest, they don't do scouting. And B, how what changes would you make them to make them necessarily better at their role, that role? Or do you think they are as good as they can be for that role? Thank you very much for watching, and um, I look forward to hearing your comments. Well, Sweden, take care.